Hello, students. So today we are still in Chapter 7. We're looking at market inefficiencies. One case in which the market tends to be inefficient is when you have public goods. So let's define what that means. To be a public good, it has to be both non-rival and non-excludable. By non-rival, we mean that if one person is getting the benefits of the good, that doesn't in any way rival. It does not interfere with someone else also enjoying the benefits. Public goods also have to be non-excludable. By that we mean you can't prevent anyone from getting the benefits of the good. So one example that fits that definition very nicely is fireworks. So fireworks are non-rival. If I can see the fireworks, that in no way prevents you, in no way interferes with you from also seeing the fireworks. Fireworks are also non-excludable. I can't prevent you from seeing my fireworks. You can't prevent me from seeing yours. Another example of public goods is lighthouses. So the light for a lighthouse helps out all the boats. You can't prevent another ship from seeing the light from the lighthouse. So it's not excludable. It's also non-rival. If I can see the light, that does not interfere with you also being able to see the light. The standard example in lots of principles courses is national defense. This also has non-rivalry and non-excludability. So let's see, um, just to make an example, it's a pretty good chance there's someone in this class named Brandon. So if you tried to exclude Brandon from national defense saying, you can't attack any Americans, but it's okay if you take out Brandon, How's that going to work? Well, if you're protecting the rest of the U.S., then you're also protecting Brandon to some extent. If we have security and um, military defenses, Brandon can still benefit from that, and he's still safer than he would have been if we just had complete anarchy. It's also non-rival. So while the military protects the rest of us, they might as well protect Brandon as well. It's not really harming the rest of us if they're also providing security to Brandon. So national defense is also a public good. Now the opposite is a private good. Private goods are both rival and excludable. So public goods are the exception rather than the rule. Most goods out there are private. So if you're wearing a pair of glasses, that's a private good. You can't have two people wearing the same pair of glasses at the same time. They don't work that way, so they're rival. You can also prevent someone from taking your glasses, so they're excludable. Same for phones. So one person uses a smartphone at a time, so they're rival. Try to get three people texting the same phone at the same time, not going to work very well. You can also prevent people from using your phone, so rival and excludable. Pencils, also rival and excludable. Trying to have three people write with the same pencil is not going to go very well. Use of the pencil is rival. You can also prevent people from using your pencil. Pencils are excludable. Shoes are rival and excludable. You can't have multiple people using the same pair of shoes at the same time. Also, you can prevent people from taking your shoes, so they're a private good. So it's a lot easier to think of examples of private goods than it is to think of examples of public goods. Public goods are the exception rather than the rule. However, they're still, they're still pretty important. That's why I have half a chapter dedicated to them. Now, there are other kinds of goods out there that are not so easily classified. One example is roads. 
So if there's not much traffic, roads function very much like a public good. If there are only three cars on the road, and now we add a fourth car, that's not really interfering very much with anybody. So it's non-rival. Trying to exclude people from roads is costly. You could set up a toll booth, but then you have to have someone operate it. And trying to exclude someone could probably just be more expensive than it's worth. So roads, when there's low traffic, could be a public good and that they're both non-rival and non-excludable. However, if traffic is high, it's a different story. If you've ever driven in high traffic, then you know that other people be on the road is going to affect your speed. If there's a lot of traffic, you can't go very fast. So now having lots of people on the road is harming other drivers. So roads, sometimes a public good, sometimes not. Depends upon the traffic. Now some goods have, are partly public, partly private. We have some names for those. If a good is non-rival, but it's excludable, we call those club goods. An example is a movie theater. You can exclude people from a movie theater. If you don't pay for your ticket, we don't let you in. So it's excludable. Movie theaters, though, are non-rival. If I can watch a movie at the theater, you can also watch it without any interference. It's not going to bother me if there's another person in there. So movie theaters are non-rival, but they are excludable. So that's not a public good, not a private good. We call this particular intermediate case a club good. Now, to be clear, um, the term club goods is not universally used. Some books might not call it that. So just a heads up on the terminology. Now, some goods are rival, but they're non-excludable. Your book refers to them as a common resource good. That's another term that's not universal, so just be aware of that. However, the terms public good and private good are universal. Everyone who's, who knows econ knows what you're talking about when you talk about that. So let's go back to our roads example. If there's a lot of congestion, a lot of traffic on the roads, then the road is now rival because your use of the road slows down other drivers. The traffic slows down everybody. So it's rival, but you still are not preventing people from using the road, so it's non-excludable. So public goods are a special kind of externality. So recall from our earlier episode, externalities affect third parties, but there's no market for them. Things like pollution affect other people, but there's no market for pollution. And we saw that the market is typically inefficient when dealing with externalities. That is because of the first fundamental welfare theorem. The first fundamental welfare theorem says if there's a perfectly competitive market for every good, then the market is efficient. Well, externalities are goods that don't have a market. So first fundamental welfare doesn't apply. So one issue you get with public goods is something called the free rider problem. Public goods are non-excludable and non-rival. That means you can still enjoy the benefits from them even if you don't pay. That means there is very little incentive to pay for a public good voluntarily. As a result, the market's not going to provide enough public goods. I think I used the example briefly in the introduction, but let's go into a bit more depth. You might have had a group project at school at some point. So everyone in the group is supposed to work together to finish the project and make it a success. Oftentimes there's one, sometimes more than one if you're unlucky, lazy person who doesn't put in the effort and he has free ride on your hard work. That's the free rider problem. There's also online piracy of music and movies. We'll talk more about this later, but music and movies are protected by copyright laws. So 
you can't copy it without permission, and to get permission, you just gotta pay somebody. But a lot of people just download music and movies for free without paying and in violation of the law. So music and movies are public goods. They are, well, they try to exclude people by making them pay, but in practice, it hasn't gone very well. It's for all practical purposes, non-excludable. It's also non-rival. So if I'm watching a movie on my computer through the internet, I'm not preventing you in any way from watching the same movie at the same time. The same is true for music. So they're a public good and people often free ride and don't pay for them by illegally downloading or streaming them. We'll talk more about this later in the chapter on monopolies for why there are copyright laws, why they exist, what's the economic justification for them. Another issue you get with public goods is the tragedy of the commons. This is especially true for common resource goods. So this comes about from um, England where small towns have this area that they call the commons. Anyone could take their cattle there and let them graze without any restrictions. So because anyone could use it, it was non-excludable. Use of the commons, though, is rival. So what people do is they'd always have their cattle graze in the commons first, only when they've exhausted that, only then do they have the cattle graze on their own private land. So as a result, the commons would get depleted and we all devoured all the grass there and there'd be nothing left. People wouldn't care about the commons because the commons are somebody else's problem. I take care of my own property because my own property belongs to me and I care about my stuff. So the commons got depleted and private lands though were okay. Congested roads are also an example of the tragedy of the commons. So anyone can use the roads if there's no toll booth and most roads don't have a toll booth. So people overuse this common resource because there's no incentive to conserve a common resource. So roads often get too much traffic, especially in big cities. Another example is overfishing. So fishing is fairly not excludable. They try to make laws about how much you can fish, but good luck trying to patrol the whole ocean, trying to enforce that for an entire ocean. So for all practical purposes, non-excludable. So fishers often, well, I don't know how often it is. I don't know the fishery research very well. Fishers might feel that they just fish as much as they want without restrictions. They don't really, they may not care a whole lot about the overall ocean's health and the health of the fish population. So overfishing could very easily occur. So one way to try to prevent the tragedy of the commons would be through privatization. So going back to England where people were having their cattle overgraze, if they just divide up the commons into a private property, now people have an incentive to care about it. I don't mind if the commons get to play because that's somebody else's problem, but I do care about my own land. I want my own land to have value, so people then start being more careful with their cattle grazing. Now, privatization doesn't always apply to these other issues, though. So let's talk about fishing. I can divide up the commons in England, just divide up the land, divide up the ocean, not quite so easy. You need some different approach to that. With um, traffic and congestion, you could have tolls to regulate that. Now, the issue you face, though, is that Collecting a toll is costly. Everyone's got to slow down, wait in line, pay the toll, and that is a burden for everyone, not just the pain of the toll, but also the process of slowing down and losing time. However, in recent decades, there's been advances in trying to just read your license plate automatically and send you a bill. That's what they actually do in Massachusetts. I was driving there back when we had life before COVID, you could still travel and do stuff. 
I was in Massachusetts, and I just got a bill in the mail a week or two later telling me what my toll was for the roads. So you could be able to privatize the roads that way by charging a toll in a way that is not burdensome to collect. So you might be able to fix some problems, but not all of them through privatization. Overfishing still needs some other solution to that. Now there are some challenges in trying to provide public goods efficiently. So we saw with our first fundamental welfare theorem, markets that are competitive are good at handling private goods, but also good at public goods and externalities. We learned about that earlier. So if you're trying to fix that, you wanna know what is society's benefit from this public good like fireworks or national defense that's really hard to get a number for that. So exactly how much does the public value fireworks? I'm not really sure how to answer that question. So first thought was maybe give them a survey, but people have no incentive to be truthful on a survey. Someone who really likes fireworks a lot could just lie or exaggerate and we wouldn't know. National defense, it's also really hard to know exactly how much people care about that. So if you knew you designed the right tax or subsidy or program to get the right amount, problem is we don't know. We're kind of just guessing here. Pollution, there is research in trying to quantify how bad is the pollution problem, how much harm does it do, and there's some work on that. Um, but again, there's uncertainty there. I'd say though, probably more than certainty about the benefits of national defense. It just feels like a very hard thing to quantify. So with the main problems, we know the market's not going to be efficient. We know some kind of government intervention is going to be required. Try to figure out what the intervention should look like. How big should it be? That's very difficult sometimes. So that wraps up chapter seven. So be sure to tune in for our next episode in which we'll start chapter eight. Stay healthy.